Hi folks, I hope you had a great break, took some time off from school. I um, want to welcome you back and we're going to start in with a whole new unit here. It focuses on the period from 1750 to about 1900. And with that, let's just dive right into this. So in thinking about this period, um, between 1750 and 1900, the political and economic of the world political and economic order, sorry, of the world um, fundamentally changed. So think back to the previous unit that ended in 1750. We discussed how Europeans had colonized the Americas and participated in the first global economy, but they were primarily middlemen moving goods and enslaved people around the world, especially in the Atlantic Ocean, but bringing goods from the Indian Ocean world into the Atlantic world as well. It's important to keep in mind, though, that like in 1750, the Indian Ocean was really still the center of the world. The Qing Empire in China was at its height politically and economically. The Qing ruled over territory in East and Central Asia. Their influence extended into Southeast Asia. Chinese silks, porcelain, tea were all being exported from China and sent around the world. And even in 1750, the Mughal Empire had just started to lose control over its territory in South Asia, but the economy of India was still incredibly prosperous. Indian cotton textiles were being exported and traded around the world. And if we keep moving a little further <clears throat> west, the Ottoman Empire, even though it was not at its height in terms of political power, it was still as powerful, if not more powerful, than any European state. By 1900, all of those things are going to change and look really differently. And there's a few things that are happening simultaneously. The first, and what we're going to get into in a few minutes, is this series of revolutions that sweeps through the Atlantic world. Historians often talk about the Atlantic revolutions, revolutions in North America, France, Haiti, and Latin America that transformed how states worked. It also led to people seeing themselves less as subjects to monarchs, more as citizens of a state. So that creates a significant political shift. And then you have a significant economic shift in the 19th century. Europeans, starting with the British, begin industrializing, changing how they manufacture goods. And this leads to an explosion in economic productivity. When you take these combined economic and political shifts, it changes how Europeans start to see themselves. And by the end of the century, Europeans are trying to take over the rest of the world. You can see on this map here that the areas in salmon color were where Europeans primarily had <clears throat> colonial holdings in 1860. And then by the end of the 1800s, all of that area in green is going to come under European influence and control. And so this becomes known as new imperialism. With this shift, you start to have a restructuring of the whole global economy away from the Indian Ocean at the center and more now towards the North Atlantic, that Europeans, especially the British and the French, but increasingly the Germans as well, dominate much of the global sort of setup. Now, as we're thinking about this, I have emphasized Europeans a lot. And the Europeans play a major role in this period. But when we're talking about this idea of how the modern world came to be, and when I use that phrase modern, I want to emphasize we're going to use it in a particular way, and we'll get more into this in class. But it's not just a European process. So one of the challenges that we're going to have in this unit is not only focusing on what Europeans are doing, but also thinking about how do Africans, Asian, indigenous peoples, Latinx peoples, how do they develop their own forms of modernity? And so that will be a recurring theme that we'll come back to. So the main focus at the start of this unit is on the Atlantic revolutions. And I wanna just help set this up for us so we can investigate them more in class. So 
the period of the Atlantic Revolutions is basically a 50-year period here from about 1775 to 1825. And as I mentioned earlier, we usually mean North America, France, Haiti, and Latin America when we're talking about the Atlantic Revolutions. The issue is that way of thinking about revolutions is changing, that increasingly historians talk about a broader global age of revolutions that began a little earlier, lasts a little longer. The recent book, Waves Across the South, have explored these revolutionary changes in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific world. So even though we're talking about the Atlantic world, there is a possibility that this might not really be just an Atlantic phenomenon. But for the next few days, the focus is on the Atlantic world. And so let's just recap what we've seen over the last couple of months in class, that there's been an incredible change to the Atlantic world as Europeans began reaching out into the Atlantic and colonizing the Americas and gaining footholds along the coast of Western Africa, they created this new Atlantic triangle trade that's sometimes used. But I think it's best to just be honest here. It's a system that's based on slavery, the transatlantic slave system, extracting people from West Africa, bringing them to the Americas to grow crops, which can then be moved around the world. And it's all designed to generate wealth for Europeans. Now, even though the system is in place by 1750, we've seen how indigenous peoples, enslaved Africans, were continually resisting it. Okay, so even though we talk about a stable system at times, it never really was stable. Additionally, during the 1700s, Within Europe, and in parts of North America as well, you have white Europeans beginning to think about this new way of looking at and talking the world, which they call the Enlightenment. All right? And there's questioning about basic assumptions with politics, the economy, social hierarchies. It's also important, as we saw, there's limits to how far people are willing to go. Also, how many people are involved in this Enlightenment. But it's there, and it's definitely affecting some individuals. Also, right before the Atlantic Revolutions, you had the Seven Years' War. We talked about this as like the first First World War, and this was this massive conflict which begins in North America, spreads throughout the Atlantic, but also has ripple effects into other parts of the world, primarily in northeastern India, the region of Bengal. In this Seven Years' War, it highlighted the rivalries that existed in the Atlantic world and the changes in power. And at the end of the war, some of the empires, especially the British and the Spanish, begin to try to change how they govern their colonies in the Americas. They introduce a series of reforms, and I use reforms in air quotes, because it's really a way about how can they govern these territories more securely, extract more resources from them, and even not have to spend as much money. So we use this word reform loosely in this case. So if that's our background here, how to think about the revolutions themselves. It's very easy to get caught up in lots of names, lots of dates, battles, all this sort of stuff. I'm not worried about those things. I'm not going to keep you to make, hold you accountable. What I do care about is how well you can understand the causes and the effects of these revolutions. And so when thinking about the causes, there's a few categories that are helpful. The first is what were the political tensions that existed between people in the Atlantic world, between colonies and the mother countries back in Europe? We can also think about economic tensions, how trade was regulated or not regulated, the types of economic systems in place. And we can also think about social tensions, you know, right? who has power within any given society? Is it equally distributed? Do some groups have more power than others? Are there inequalities? So those three tensions really get at the heart of the causes. And as you're reading, you want to think about those. And then we can also think about 
if there are any philosophical ideas that people use to justify their revolutions. So those are our causes for in terms of effects, all right? The start of thinking about effects will look very familiar. How did these revolutions transform the political structures? How did these revolutions change things economically? Or did it, they change things economically? Maybe some revolutions did, maybe some different didn't. Sorry. We can also ask the same sort of question of what effects did the revolutions have or not have on social structures? What will be kind of different here is to think, how did any one revolution affect the states around it in the subsequent revolutions? And then lastly, this is not so much effects, but it's worthwhile to consider the difference between short-term effects and long-term effects. So things that happen within five to 10 years of the revolution, short-term, things more than 10 years, we'll call long-term. And with that, we're gonna dive into this a whole lot more together in class. Thanks.